Good morning once more to one and all and welcome back to this ocean of devotion and dedication. Yoga is education, an education of the human mind, body and spirit. The yogic experience is one of the finest this world has to offer. It is that which takes one to the pinnacle of experience and beyond. Let us take a dip into this ocean with today's plenary session that will be chaired by Dr. A.M. Murthy, Vice Chancellor of the Tamil Nadu State University. He is an alumnus of Kevalidham and it is an honor to have him with us here today. We are very happy to see that he has excelled and reached such great heights in his career. Dr. Murthy completed his Masters in Yoga from Tamil Nadu Physical Education and Sports University, followed by a Diploma in Yoga Education in 92, 1982 from GS College of Yoga and Cultural Synthesis, Kevalidham. He has conducted many research projects in yoga and has published two books, Yoga, Relaxation and Anatomy, and Physical Health, Education and Yogic Practices. He has also published and presented many research articles. We would now like to introduce our plenary speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Shirley Tellis. Dr. Tellis holds a PhD in Neurophysiology and MPhil in Neurophysiology from MBBS and, and an MBBS from Goa Medical College. Dr. Tellis is the director of Patanjali Research Foundation Haridwar. She has 159 research publications and enthusiastically practices yoga. Our second speaker is a renowned professor, Dr. S. V. Khalsa. He is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, USA. Dr. Sadbir Singh Khalsa has been fully engaged in basic and clinical research on the effectiveness of yoga and meditational practices, improving physical and psychological health since 2001. He has also been personally involved in the practice of yoga lifestyle since 1971. He is currently the director of research for the Kundalini Research Institute, research director for the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, and research associate at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine and an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Medicine and Women's Hospital in Boston. At the center of his interest is an evaluation of yoga within the academic curriculum for public schools to determine the benefits of students in mental health. Dr. Khalsa works with the International Association of Yoga Therapists to promote research on yoga therapy, serving as the scientific coordinator for the annual symposium on yoga research and as an editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Yoga Therapy. He is the author of the Harvard Medical School e-book entitled Your Brain on Yoga and is chief editor of an upcoming professional level textbook entitled The Principles and Practices of Yoga in Healthcare. Since 2005, he has also been teaching an elective course at the Harvard Medical School in Mind Body Medicine. Good morning to everybody. Uh, pranam to Swamiji, Swami Kuryananji, Swami Tigambarji, Honorable Tiwariji, most respected Swodhi and my dear members. First of all, I must tell a lady from Sirli Yani, she worked at uh, Bangalore Yoga University. She did a lot of research. She has done a lot of books. And it's uh, worthwhile to be there, to mention few. Uh, she has done the neurophysiology only, the brain activity of the students, especially on school children. That is a today we need. And apart from that, now she is working at topmost yoga institute uh, in the, especially Ramdev, but research is concerned, now they have started. The research is concerned, I still I believe the topmost in the world is Kaivali Dharma. Now they have, they have started, after seeing the Kaivali Dharma, Kaivali Dharma started first in research in yoga, Swamiji, Tiwariji, all the things. So why I am telling, I was partially involved in most all the activity I used to watch. And another giant of the Harvard University, maybe he is from the India, but his contribution in the Harvard University is a vast. It's a brain activity. That is uh, his nature. And he did 1971 onwards yoga practices. I did my uh, here in um, 1972, where I did my certificate course in yoga first. And you did practice in 1971 yoga. And also he did a lot of research on the brain activity. Not only that one, he is 
as an assistant professor of medicine, he shifted to Kundalini Yoga. He is a, at present, he is a director and as well as a medical profession and practicing himself with yoga only. Really, I am extremely happy. We are on behalf of the world. And these two people, O.P. Tiwariji and uh, especially uh, Sbozji, I welcome you. Thank you very much, sir, for that kind introduction. I bring you greetings from the north of India, from our institution, Patanjali Yogpeet, and from our founders, Swami Ramdevji, Acharya Balkrishnaji. It is always when I come to uh, Kaivalya Dham that I come with a great sense of reverence because this is where, as rightly said, yoga research began. And I am very grateful to the organizers. Tiwariji, I humbly offer my pranams. Subodhji, thank you very much for inviting me here. It gives us a sense of continuum. We are all part of this long stream of people who are trying to use laboratory methods which are internationally acceptable to put yoga on the world map so that they can experience the benefits that we feel in our daily life. And here I'm particularly here to tell you in the next 28 minutes or so about how uh, yoga research can convince people that yoga is necessary for school children. When we actually uh, talk about yoga research, so a number of techniques have been used throughout the years. Brain waves, memory studies, attention, and so on. But nowadays, there are more exciting methods which allow us to test in real time where changes are occurring in the brain and which exact, exact neurochemical is changing and where and why. Apart from that, it is now known that our genes, our chromosomes are not static, but they change with our lifestyle, with every thought that we think. When we think a positive thought, we can correct a defective gene potentially. But that's why there's so much research nowadays on yoga, both at the level of the brain and at the level of the cell. But we must remember that yoga is first and foremost an experiential science. The ancient rishis of India passed down their experience to us through word of mouth, through etchings on palm leaves. And so old techniques such as observation, introspection, documenting what a person feels also are very important. Having said these things about how one goes about doing research in schools and in anywhere else as well, let's see the scene of the youth in India especially, as well as in other countries. It's always good to look at the positive points first. So let's see the positive points. Nowadays, there are undoubtedly better educational facilities. Because of the business partner outsourcing or BPOs, many graduates who would have gone unemployed do have a chance to get a good job. There is improved infrastructure, particularly in the cities, to live. To, there are some attempts to improve the transport, though we are all struggling with environmental issues like air pollution. And now we come to the downside. India is a developing economy, so we have the rich and the poor. Let's see the problems of, there is an overlap, but there are some problems which are peculiar to the rich and some which are peculiar to poor children. Let's look at them separately. Economically stable homes. Imagine a family, two parents, both the parents are software engineers, earning very well. What happens? The parents all want their children to excel. A lot of pressure on the children to do well. The children, the parents work long hours. The children are lonely. They come back to an empty house. They live in a high-rise, luxurious apartment, very little place to play. Not like in the old days where you play hopscotch on the road because there are too many cars. So what do they do? They are busy with their iPad, electronic games, and so on. Pac-Man is long gone. They, have, they are given a free hand to select their after-school snack. They open the fridge and they eat something unhealthy. There's a stimulation overload, TV, iPad, all the time on Instagram. Where is the time to think, to reflect? 
And unfortunately, the social media is also used for bullying. And cyberbullying is one of the projects we have taken up in Patanjali Oakbeat with a university in Norway. Yoga can help overcome these bad, not so desirable lifestyle habits and instill good habits in our children. What about children who are poor? The situation is totally different. They are malnourished. Where is the question of wrong eating? They don't have money to buy the necessary protein. They don't have money to buy lentils, which will help their brains develop. They are often subjected to physical and emotional abuse, and that could be also true of rich children. There is child labor, as you can see in the picture here. They are exposed, very vulnerable, to drugs, drink, sexual abuse. They have a lack of opportunity to study. Some villages, the teachers take the salary and close the schools. There's a basic struggle for survival. What does yoga do? We should meet the basic needs and then help the children to come out of the trauma. So we see that there is a crying need for yoga, for something, some lifestyle change, and why not yoga, which is universally applicable? If so, why don't we introduce it immediately today in all schools across India? There are certain challenges. I mentioned two. This these two challenges came to my mind when I attended a meeting way back as a student in 1990 of the National Council of Education, Research and Training, NCERT. Two challenges. One, yoga is not a secular discipline. It's a Hindu discipline. So there's going to be a lot of trouble. Fortunately, in our country, that is coming down. The more research we do, the more people will be convinced it's a science, it is a secular discipline. The second one shows children congratulating, being congratulated by their parents, put on the shoulders and hip hip hooray because they've done well in an exam. The worry of the parents was when children learn yoga, they'll become so relaxed, they won't study. How silly is that? Because actually yoga sharpens the mind. But these were objections. And of course, there are other practical considerations. Can we include it in a tight curriculum? Can we uh, have infrastructure? What about schools where there's no space? Is it replacing PE or is it along with PE? And so physical education is the short form I'm using PE. So we are convinced now that yoga is important. There are challenges, but we are eager to overcome the challenges. Why? In the year 2015, we did two surveys which looked at all the evidence available to us about yoga in schools. One was done with my colleague, Professor Kalsa, yoga in schools in the US, and Professor Kalsa will present that. And the other was done with my colleagues from Sao Paulo in Brazil, the Federal University of Sao Paulo. We looked at studies from 1980 up to uh, October 31st, 2014. We searched databases like PubMed, uh, Embase, Cyclet, PsychInfo. We looked at three things. One, yoga should not mean only asanas, but it should mean pranayama, meditation, and something more. Yoga should not only look at the academic performance of the children, but also at their emotional well-being, the way they relate to their siblings, their teachers, their parents and their own self, inner strength, their Atma Shakti. And the third point was that yoga should be part of the school uh, curriculum. Having said this, we also looked at randomized control trials, so our search narrowed down to nine studies. And I'm going to summarize seven of the points. The review was published in Evidence-Based Alternative and Complementary Medicine. If any of you want the PDF, I'll be happy to send it to you. Yoga helps children cope with stress. Now, this is a combination of many studies. When we are faced with a stress, we can cope with it in an unhealthy way. Unhealthy ways include taking drugs, taking alcohol, switching on the TV to numb your mind. Healthy ways mean talking to your parents, talking to your brothers and sisters, talking to the school counselor, developing an emotional strength Atma Shakti, inner strength. Converting violent emotions, anger, 
fury with the parents slamming the door to soft, gentle emotions, reducing the need for external stimulation, always wanting to be sitting and doing something with your iPad. No, you can sit quietly and be happy. Reducing the urge to be violent and aggressive, improving memory, particularly short-term memory, and increasing self-esteem. I'll skip the last one. It's a little complex, and I don't want to run out of time. In fact, this is a study which we did in Haridwar. You can see that we are right up in the north of India, at the, uh, very close to the Himalayas in Uttarakhand. And this was published in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in 2014. We had 90 school children, pre-teens, that is, they had, uh, between 10 to 12 years of age, 90 of them, random, and we studied a whole range of variables. We randomized, tested them, randomized them as two groups, 45 in each group. One group was yoga, one group was physical exercises. Three group differences between yoga and physical exercise. Yoga requires awareness. You cannot practice yoga without awareness. You have to practice yoga when you're relaxed. And yoga should always place an emphasis on the breath. At the end of the day, what did we find? The two groups were almost the same in everything. There was one difference, and the difference was in their self-esteem. Why were we so worried about the self-esteem? Just before the study, we looked at what are the causes of low self-esteem in preteen children in India. And we found that the greatest cause, the blue part in the pie chart, was when they do not do well in exams. That's why every year after the SSLC, after the 12th standard exams, children commit suicide. They feel that if I don't get 99 point something percent, I'm useless. We should discard this feeling in the mind of children. There is also body image. If they feel that they're fat or too thin or their muscles are not developed, they're not good enough. And socioeconomic status. What kind of car does your father use to drop you to school? Should that matter? Well, it does to these children because they're young. So yoga helped to develop their overall self-esteem, general self-esteem, and the way their parents perceive them. Physical exercise improved their social self-esteem. So both were good. But yoga had a slightly greater edge in improving two aspects of self-esteem. So we are talking a lot about emotions. What about performance? Over the years, we have done a number of studies in schools from 1992, as Sir mentioned, when I was in Bangalore, right up to the time I'm in Patanjali Oakpeet, in children during the vacations, in schools, and we've looked at different aspects. Perception, for example, perception is seeing with comprehension. You see something green, and here you realize it's the floor. You see it outside, and you realize it's the grass. Perception. Motor skills, you all know, and higher brain functions. Perception, particularly visual perception, improved in children in all ages in a variety of studies, in a variety of study designs. Very important from drawing a map in geography and filling in the science journal to web design as a career. Motor skills, the more we use electronic devices, the less we want carpal tunnel syndrome. The more we want children to be free from backache, to have a good posture. And cognition. I'm just going to say one point here. Too much emphasis is given on left brain functions, on logic, on maths, on, in, on uh, scientific thinking. Right brain functions are very important. What is right brain? You're brought for the first time to Kaivalya Dam. Someone asks you, can you find the naturopathy center? That means you have good spatial orientation. So that improves with yoga. It's a right brain function. Why? Why do we want to balance it? Because the emo emotions, artistic appreciation, creativity are all functions of the right brain. How many parents today will eagerly agree if the child says, I want to become a musician, I want to play the sitar, I'm not going to be a software engineer, though they get the marks in the 12th standard. But the child may do very well. So this is important. Now, can we link the two? And yoga offers a wonderful opportunity to link thinking and emotions. Converting emotions to rational thinking 
by knowing yoga philosophy from Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, from the Upanishads. We have wisdom which is applicable to all people across different belief systems. Why is it so important to get rid of things like depression and to create positive pathways in our brain? You can see here the ants moving. When ants move in a particular path, they create a path. Finally, you feel that there's a little path there in the grass. Like that in our brain. Let's mold our brains, which are so plastic. As the Bhagavad Gita says, repeated thinking about something makes us think, repeat, fixate on that thing. So if we can fixate on something positive, how good it will be for us, for our children. So if we can use the rational of yoga, yoga philosophy, as well as practice, it is ideal. If you don't want to give a whole lecture, just put up one thought on the board during your yoga class. It will make people think as their mind gets quiet. What happens then? Happy chemicals get secreted in the brain, like dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, oxytocin, which I know is spoken of here as very much a part of the cancer rejuvenation program. And then what happens? We think well about ourselves and about others. I'm coming to the end. This is, you see a hippopotamus trying to get slim. Can it? A, hippomot a hippopotamus can't turn into a giraffe. So we should not try to change the unchangeable. Suppose there is a child who's born short. They call them shorty in school. Suppose there's a child who's born fat. What can they do? But all the same, we should have self-awareness. We shouldn't allow ourselves to get overweight. We should say, now we are getting a little fat. Now is the time to step up my yoga. I have to get up at 5 in the morning, though it's winter. I will not eat that extra fried, fried food today. I will diet. Why? It's important for my health. Self-awareness, not self-criticism. We shouldn't put ourselves down. And we have actually done a randomized control trial which shows that yoga boosts this feeling of feeling good about yourself, about the things you cannot change. What can you do if you cannot change yourself? You don't want to go and do plastic surgery. Instead, do yoga and feel happy with yourself. And that's what yoga is all about. Hence, as I come to the end of my presentation, start early. We are all here. I started in my MPhil after MBBS. I wish I had started in school. What a wonderful opportunity it is for children who learn yoga in schools. An early beginning to promote overall well-being. And no presentation on yoga in schools is complete without a quote from the champion of youth, Swami Vivekananda. So I'll end with this. Purity, patience, perseverance. Something that doesn't look as if it'll succeed. Very often this happens with yoga research. Are the three essentials to success. But above all, karuna, compassion, love. Thank you very much. Namaste. I want to tell you one thing. 1975, the Kaivalaya Dhamma is the first institute to start the school children research. Especially stress management. If I correctly remember, 1975, O.P. Tiwariji, Ganguliji, Garotiji, ji published the paper. That's why the central school has been, the yoga has been introduced in India. That's what that Finland and West Germany and all the people called us to go to there through government of India. They also stress management for the school children there. They said lastly, Indian children are far better than other European children where stress is concerned. Anyhow, she has wonderfully presented we have research in South and North combination. It is a wonderful. Next, I call upon the stalwart in Harvard University and himself is a yoga practitioner, Kundalini Yoga. He will present about especially on the brain activity of the children as well as Kundalini Yoga. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Murthy and uh, Dr. Tellis and uh, respected delegates. It's always a, a great honor for me to be here at Kaivalya Dam, which is, uh, Swami Kaivalyananda was absolutely unprecedented in his uh, start in yoga research. In fact, 
it was, it was decades before other researchers began doing research in, in yoga. So 1924, uh, I look forward to celebrating 100 years uh, when uh, the time has come when uh, we will celebrate the 100 years of, of that start of yoga research on the planet. So I, I would like to share with you a number of topics um, that relate to ultimately yoga in the schools. Uh, but I want to start with the discussion about the psychophysiology of yoga, what we know about um, how yoga works from the biomedical and, and, and neurophysiological perspectives. And this is some, somewhat summarized by my uh, yoga teacher, my yoga master, Yogi Bhajan, who said, yoga teaches you the techniques and awareness to stay healthy. You gain strong immune glandular and nervous systems. This foundation gives you energy and lets you deal with the mental and spiritual facets of your life. And so what he's suggesting here is what we know about yoga, is that yoga improves your function on many different levels, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And a lot of what I'm uh, presenting here is, has been presented in, in this ebook called Your Brain on Yoga. The remarkable thing about this ebook, it was written for the general public. Ordinarily, I don't like to write books for the general public because I'm a researcher, but Harvard, Pub, Pub, Harvard Health Publications approached me to do a book on yoga, and so I could not turn down this opportunity to have a book in the universe that has the Harvard Medical School logo and their name with the word yoga on the same cover. And I can tell you that 20 years ago, this would have been impossible. So yoga has made enormous strides in society. A lot of what I'm going to talk about is now well recognized in the field of science. In fact, there are now publications that are available that discuss and describe the neurophysiology uh, underlying the practices of yoga. So there are a number of papers that are available to, 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 to look at this information. Going back historically, uh, one of the earliest studies that was really significant in terms of uh, discussing the, the neurophysiology of how yoga works was the work of Bakshi and Wenger, and of course these scientists were here at Kaivalyadama as well. Um, and what they concluded from this year-long study, they traveled all over India studying yoga masters, uh, and what they concluded from this study was that physiologically yogic meditation represents deep relaxation of the autonomic nervous system. This means that yoga practitioners have the capability of controlling their internal state, of controlling their central nervous system, their autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is significant because this is where one of the stress response um, uh, mechanisms in our body is located. This is the sympathetic, parasympathetic system, and yoga has direct impact. So when we practice yoga, we gain this ability to self-regulate our internal state. Now moving forward to the to the edge, to the cutting edge of research, one of these areas is in molecular biology. We are now starting to see changes in genomic expression. In other words, our behavior, our yoga practice can actually change which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And not surprisingly, the genes that are turned on are the genes that are good for us, reducing inflammation, reducing the stress response, um, and, and helping us cope with stress. And so this is a, a, a fantastic uh, phenomenon in, in modern science because we now can look at the molecular level of how yoga has impact on the body from the bottom up. The other area of cutting edge research in yoga and meditation is neuroimaging. And these are sophisticated techniques that can look at the brain as it is behaving from second to second and it can very, very uh, finally pinpoint areas of the brain that are being activated. And so what this is now showing us is that when we are meditating, when we are doing these yoga practices, we are changing brain activity, and ultimately we are also changing brain structure. So this study was actually conducted at the National Institutes of Health in, our, in the United States, and it is a landmark study because it, it shows that people who practice yoga have higher pain tolerance. They are able to tolerate cold better than non-yoga practitioners. So there's something about pain regulation that is improved when you practice yoga. Not only that, but the areas of the brain that are involved in pain regulation change not only in activity, but in structure. Our brain is plastic, so those areas of the brain involved in pain regulation actually grow. And in fact, on the graph on the right-hand side, 
the area, the structure of the brain that's involved in pain regulation is directly correlated with how many years you've been practicing yoga. So the more you practice, the more you end up with a yoga brain. Now, as I mentioned, stress is one of the areas that, that is very uh, precisely impacted by yoga practice. And this is a graph from a survey that we conducted in the United States on beginning yoga practitioners. We asked them, why are you coming to practice yoga? The big three answers were general wellness, physical exercise, and stress management. And stress management is one of the biggest uh, outcomes of yoga practice because it cuts deeply into the reason for um, uh, mood changes, for well-being, and also for many diseases. In fact, we now have re review papers published that talk about uh, all of the research that's been done on yoga for stress. And this particular study uh, has concluded that, that many, of, many of the studies conducted on yoga show very uh, profound improvements in stress regulation. This body of research in, in, in yoga is growing dramatically. It is exponentially increasing. Um, there are new publications virtually every week, new clinical trials by new investigators studying what yoga's effects are. This body of evidence has grown to such an extent that it has justified our holding a symposium on yoga research in the United States, and we've just held the last one just this last September, and Dr. Gangadhar, a leading researcher in India from Nimhans, uh, was one of our keynote speakers. This body of evidence has also grown to the extent that we now have clinical trials research on yoga for a variety of different medical and mental health conditions. And this has justified the, the preparation of a textbook. This textbook is called The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare, and I'm joined by Shirley Tellis as one of the co-editors of this textbook. This will be a landmark book because it will have 60 contributors, most of whom are leading yoga researchers across the world who contributed chapters on yoga for a variety of different um, um, medical and, and mental health conditions, providing the research evidence. And we also have input from many yoga therapists providing best practices as to how, these, uh, how yoga can improve um, functioning uh, for, for patient populations. So I like to summarize the psychophysiology of yoga in this logic model. At the top you have the basic yoga practices, postures, breathing, relaxation, and meditation. Of course, there are other yoga practices, but these are the basic ones for which we have lots of research evidence. On the left-hand side, we see that it is primarily through the meditation that we improve mind-body awareness. This is a key phenomenon in yoga practice. This improves our mindfulness, our ability to control mental attention, because that is one of the basic uh, principles involved in meditation is control of attention. That improves our concentration, our cognition, and ultimately our self and social awareness. I've talked about self-regulation in the middle box. That improves our ability to re uh, regulate emotions, to be able to regulate stress. Ultimately, that leads to a change that leads us to be resilient to stress, and to have equanimity in the face of emotions. We are able to control and, and cope with our stress and emotions more effectively. That ultimately leads to a psychological self-efficacy. We have more control over our lives, uh, more sense of, of um, uh, taking, taking the direction in, in where we want to go and what we want to experience. And then finally, we know, of course, that through these asanas, through the pranayamas, we're improving our physical fitness, improving our flexibility, our strength, our balance, our respiratory function, and ultimately that leads to physical self-efficacy. Now, these three boxes are not independent. They are all interacting with each other. So this physical self-efficacy actually leads to psychological self-efficacy. And the control of attention, when we meditate, we are activating the frontal lobe, the, the, the frontal cortex, which has inhibitory connections with our emotional brain, the limbic system. So in fact, when we meditate, we are actually regulating our emotional brain in the limbic system. Ultimately, all of these skills lead to this better functioning uh, of us as human beings. And this includes behaviors, mental state, health, and performance, and a variety of different characteristics. Improved mood, well-being, a reduction in psychological disorders, improvements in positive behaviors, reduction in negative behaviors, improvements in physical health, cognitive and academic performance, relationships, and ultimately 
quality of life. And what I have not included on here, but we also will study at some point in time, is spiritual health uh, and transformation. So how does this apply to yoga uh, for children and adolescents? Well, our children and adolescents, as Shirley Tellis has shown the situation here in India, the situation in, in North America and the United States and in elsewhere outside of India is similar. Our children and adolescents are under a severe burden. Uh, a lot of this is coming from stress and the inability to cope with stress. The stress comes from a variety of sources, developmental, family issues, social, academic, societal pressures. Ultimately, this leads to a number of different problems in our children and adolescents, including behavior problems, mental health uh, problems, including disorders such as uh, depression and anxiety, attention problems, academic problems, grades uh, falling down and children dropping out of school, and even physical health problems, epidemics in our children in obesity, and even type 2 diabetes. And this is a survey that was done in the United States on mental health in adults. And what they concluded in this study was that the majority of mental health conditions in adults actually started in adolescence and childhood. So the idea is that we need to not be treating these problems in adulthood. We need to be treating these problems in our children and adolescents so that we can prevent uh, mental health problems in the future. And furthermore, this, this, this study also concluded that there's a great need for the treatment of largely untreated child-adolescent mental health disorders. Um, so we have other surveys that, that basically verify this result, that 7.5% uh, of adolescents have uh, a dsm 4 which is a, a bona fide mental health condition. The most consistent factors behind these disorders is indicators of stress and that personal resources such as mastery enhance resilience to the onset of these disorders. So we're talking about any kind of behavioral practice that can give us a sense of mastery and control stress will reduce this burden of mental health. Yoga fits this bill exactly. And the most disturbing research study in the United States looked at the cumulative prevalence over uh, 10 years of children whether they develop a mental health condition. The lifetime prevalence of psychiatric problems by age 21 well exceeds 80%, suggesting that the experience of psychiatric illness is nearly universal in our children and adolescents. So our children have a great need for some uh, therapy or some intervention that can help them cope with all of this uh, burden. Yoga has been shown to be effective in children and also in children with medical and physical conditions. And these are a couple of review papers that have been published. Uh, this is Gurjeet Birdie's paper in 2009, Clinical Applications of Yoga for the Pediatric pop Population. Another review in 2008, Therapeutic Effects of Yoga for Children. A more recent paper by my colleague, um, uh, Lisa Cayley Isley in the UK, Yoga as a Complementary Therapy for Children and Adolescents. It is applicable to children. Yoga works for children. And in fact, these studies that have been done in children have shown that indeed we can reduce stress, anxiety, and depression in children. We can improve their self-concept, improve their cognitive function, their memory, and their perception. They improve on physical levels, flexibility, cardiopulmonary fitness. They can improve psychomotor and neuromuscular performance, and even uh, this can contribute to weight loss. Um, the popularity of uh, yoga practice in children is actually strong and growing. We have survey studies done in the United States on the prevalence of yoga practice both in adults and in children. And in children we see that uh, in 2007, 2.5% 2 of children had been practicing yoga which increased to 3.2% um, in 2012. So this is growing in children. So yoga is being practiced by children and we need surveys here in India to also give us a sense of how much of the public and how much of the children and adolescents are practicing yoga. In fact, in the United States, we have now had two conferences, the National Kids Yoga Conference, which brings together all of the teachers who are teaching yoga to children. Um, and this is held in Washington, DC and will be held as an annual conference. Now, where is the best place to give yoga to children? Well, obviously, if we bring it into the schools, all of the children will get it. 
because all children go to school, so this is the place where yoga belongs. Yoga belongs as a strategy for coping with life, for improving functioning overall. Just as much as we need geography and mathematics, we need life skills taught in our schools. And so we have prepared a rationale paper. Uh, this is going to be published in 2016. This was a collaboration with Dr. Shirley Tellis. Um, and this is a rationale which talks about a lot of the physiology I've just talked about and the need for why we need uh, yoga in our school system. This is the kind of research summary paper that you can give to a principal in a school and argue for having yoga implemented in the school. Now this idea of yoga in education is not new. In fact, uh, in the 1800s, it was Swami Vivekananda who said, the very essence of education is concentration of mind, not the collection of facts. If I had to do my education once again, I would not study facts at all. I would develop the power of concentration and detachment and then move forward. And then in the West, uh, William James, very famous um, medical professor at Harvard Medical School, was influenced by Vivekananda. He said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the, root, the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is master of himself if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. And what he's referring to is meditation. He's talking about the control of attention, the ability to meditate and develop self-awareness in our children. In a book that was published in 1914 called The Hygiene of the School Child, it was predicted that the health and welfare of a child will be regarded of, of one as much importance as arithmetic and geography. We have not succeeded 100 years later. We are nowhere near succeeding in that. Our children are learning mathematics and geography, but they're not able to cope with life. So um, we have also done a survey study, and this again was in collaboration with Dr. Tellis. Uh, there are now in the United States a number of yoga programs that are offered for public schools. And these are standardized curricula that have been developed specifically for implementation in school settings. And the this, this results of the survey showed that there are 36 such existing formalized yoga programs being offered in the United States. Um, these Programs have been in existence anywhere from two to 20 years with an average of nine years. About 940 in schools uh, across the United States are, are being implemented. Uh, these programs are being Im implemented with more, with more than 5,400 trained yoga instructors from these programs. Many of these programs require a, 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 a 200-hour Yoga Alliance certification for training, and 75% of the programs uh, are offering uh, from preschool to high school uh, the full range of uh, uh, child education. Um, in the UK, uh, recently there was the first conference on yoga for education. This was attended by about 150 to 200 individuals. This will likely become an annual conference. In the United States, there has been a gathering of 50 of many of the leading yoga in schools instructors. And what they did under the banner of the Yoga Service Council in the United States was that they created this week-long focus group to decide and create a white book. And this white book uh, is called Best Practices for Yoga in Schools. And it goes through all of the details of what is necessary and what is best in terms of how to bring yoga into a school setting, how to teach the yoga, what the requirements are, what the best circumstances are for providing yoga in a school setting. So now I want to sort of talk about where we are with respect to research that's ongoing in, in yoga in the school setting. And the research in yoga in schools is growing and becoming stronger. In fact, we have had now uh, for two times the Yoga in Schools Symposium, which has a research day uh, devoted to scientists who come from around the world to share um, their experiences in research in yoga in school settings. And the next one is held in March of, the, of 2016. There has been a couple of review papers published on yoga in schools. The first one was by Sirwaki and Catherine cook Couton back in 2012. And more recently, uh, Dr. Tellis has just presented to you uh, the review paper that she has done in collaboration uh, with the Brazilian group uh, with Alyssa Casaza. Um, and this is a uh, 
meta-analysis, which is a high-level statistical analysis of randomized controlled trials that have been conducted in school settings. And this is one of the figures from that graph, um, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, but um, the idea is that there are benefits that are being shown through this scientific research in randomized controlled trials that yoga has benefit for children in school settings. More recently, um, we are, uh, I have just submitted a paper which is a bibliometric review of published yoga in school studies. Um, the total number of studies that has been published is 50. Now, I am aware actually of about a half a dozen to a dozen studies that are in process or have been submitted for publication. So this number, by the time this paper is published, this number will be well out of date. About two thirds of these studies were done in the United States and about a quarter of them were done in India. 60% of the studies were done in elementary school and 25% in high school settings. Only half of these have used randomized control trials um, and about a quarter of these studies were uncontrolled studies, which is the weakest kind of study. So um, the good news is that half of them are randomized control trials, but we need to move more towards these randomized control trials, which are the gold standard form of research. Only 10% of these programs were after school programs, which is good because we are actually doing the studies in the, in the school curriculum as opposed to after school. This is a graph of the publication date of all of these 50 publications. And what you can see is that the vast majority of these publications have occurred um, over the past five years or so. But look at this trend. This is exponential. This is this rapidly growing increase and work in this area. And when you look at the randomized control trials in the graph on the red, that is also growing, suggesting that the number of randomized control, control trials is also growing in this field, which is very encouraging. What are we finding in these studies? We are finding essentially what we find in adults. Yoga works in the same way in children as it does in adults. It improves stress coping, self-regulation, it improves physical and emotional arousal, improves aggression, hostility, anger, it improves mood, anxiety, and depression, rumination, cognitive functioning, self-esteem, mental, social, and physical well-being, and even behavior change. And in our studies, um, these are the studies that we did, did some time ago, a few years ago. These were randomized control trials. We did 12-week uh, interventions within the school setting. We compared uh, uh, yoga practices with their regular physical education classes. We conducted qualitative interviews and also self-report mental health questionnaire uh, outcome measures. And what we found um, in, in, in our first studies was this pattern here. You can see that the pink is the yoga group showing marginal improvements in social stress, attitude to school, and a number of other of these mental health characteristics. But the control group that did not practice yoga in the blue, you can see that over a single semester, they are deteriorating in mental health characteristics. We are seeing, as it happens, the deterioration in mental health in our children and adolescents. And what yoga has done in this study, it has acted as preventive medicine to prevent this deterioration in mental health. We recently did a study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the United States in a single school, looking at risk factors for substance use. And what we found in terms of the willingness of children to smoke cigarettes is that they were equivalent at the baseline, but at the end of the treatment phase, the control group had increased their willingness to smoke cigarettes, whereas the yoga group had maintained their levels. So again, yoga is acting as preventive medicine. We also have conducted a study on grades. And what we found, as you can see, uh, is the cumulative grade point index, the, the solid line going down deteriorates. This is the control group, whereas the yoga group was able to maintain their grade levels. So again, there's, there's, there's some growing evidence that yoga will not only improve these mental health characteristics and performance, but also academic performance, which of course is very important to the schools. And then finally, I think we're going to be moving towards more physiological outcomes. This is a study that we did that showed that great truth students uh, after a yoga intervention, were able to, uh, we were able to observe reductions in salivary cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. So we're able to actually look at object objective measures and show that indeed uh, we can actually change physiology in these children. And I want to end with um, some of the evidence that we get from qualitative interviews. Because a lot of the quantitative studies in yoga and schools research are problematic. We're not, we don't have the right instruments yet. It's difficult to do research in children. 
and, and so we are, we are finding our way to try and get the best uh, tools to measure these changes in children. And one of the important ways we do this is actually with qualitative interviews, where you sit down with your children and you say, okay, what did you experience? What did this do for you? What, how did it change your life? And this gives us a sense of, of how they're changing and might lead us into instruments that could measure these changes in these children. And I want to share some of the quotes that the children actually provide after uh, a yoga intervention. And I've talked a lot about stress, and that is one of the things that children talk about. So one student said, before you're taking a test, relax and breathe, and you don't get as nervous or as tense. Another student said, I used breathing outside the classroom in my life to calm me down. If I was stressed or angry, I would then do the breathing to calm me down, and I will probably continue to do this. I was less anxious about school in general. And these children, once they learn pranayama, immediately they're taking it home. They're teaching their parents pranayama. They're, they're, they're using pranayama in circumstances where they are stressed. They will say things like, before I hit my brother, I stop, I breathe, and then I don't have to do that. And I change my behavior because I'm now getting some self-control from these practices. So these changes are immediate. And once these children learn these skills, they have it for the rest of their life. It's not like a drug where you have to keep buying it and taking it. Once you learn the skill, you have it for your life. Another student said, yoga definitely helped with sleeping. It would take me a long time to get to sleep. When I was doing yoga, it was much easier to fall asleep and stay asleep. And this is all about psychophysiological arousal and tension and stress. And that is the opposite of sleep. If you're tense and stressed, you cannot sleep. If you reduce and relax, that's what yoga can do to facilitate your sleep. And another topic of mind-body awareness, which is a key finding, one student said, I learned how to pay attention to how my body feels. This is so fundamental to yoga practice. This is what every yoga teacher in every yoga class is saying. Pay attention, focus, meditate, concentrate. Another student said, respecting how my body works, the poses helped with gaining control over myself. Yoga gave me a new perspective on my body, and I have more control than I thought I did. I could not say this any better in describing how yoga affects self-regulation. And then how does this manifest? How does this change behavior? One student said, I have been eating healthier, more fruits and vegetables, and not a lot of junk food. For example, ice cream and candy. We did not give them any recommendations on diet. This child changed the behavior because their self-awareness increased, and they noticed that when they ate junk food, they didn't feel as good. So they change their behavior because of this improvement in self-awareness. This is a key. This is behavior change in medicine from the bottom up. And then finally, transformation. We live in a society that still is basically a rat race. It's all about how many cars you have and what job you get and how much money you make. And we need to change that. And yoga has the possibility of changing that attitude, of changing that life perspective. One student said, I am fascinated by the culture of yoga, how people can change their lives and help themselves physically, emotionally. I'm interested in learning more. This person has started on the path to self-growth through yoga practice. Another student said, I have been more, a lot more happier lately. I feel like a better person, making better choices and staying out of trouble. And then finally, we have held this one uh, school, we've held uh, yoga practices in this one school for a number of years. And so we have a chance to see what's happening at the whole school level. And we did a focus group with the school administration. And this is a quote from the school counselor who said, yoga has made a huge impact on our school. It is making our school a better place. And when you change the individual, you change the classroom. When you change the classroom, you change the school. When you change the school, you change the county. When you change the county, you change the state. When you change the state, you change the country, and so on until you change the world. So this is not minor stuff. If we can implement yoga into every school for three generations, we have the opportunity to change society as a whole. And so I'm indebted to the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health, which has provided the funding to support a lot of my yoga in schools research. Um, I'm also indebted to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which funded the recent study on risk factors for, uh, for substance use. I'm also indebted to the Kundalini Research Institute, which helps fund my research efforts in yoga. 
And I wanted to end with this cartoon. And although this says evolution of Americans, believe me, this is evolution of humans. Because the disorders that we are facing, um, the so-called epidemic of non-communicable diseases, lifestyle diseases, type 2 diabetes, obesity, depression, these are growing in epidemic proportions. And the reason is that we don't have skill sets in our education system or even in our medical system to allow us to cope with stress, to self-regulate, to transform our perspective on life. And if we can do the research on yoga in schools, we can justify the implementation of yoga into the school setting, where it belongs. It belongs in our schools to, to bring our children not only the skills to get a job, but also the skills to live a healthy life. And if we can do that in every school, we can change the scenario from this cartoon to this cartoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Satbir Singh Ji. It's a wonderful you have done. What are research from the beginning? What was the past of the children? What the present day? What will be the future? Oriented psychophysiological variables. He has taken neurophysiological variable, physical variable. You see, the research has done wonderfully. The variables has been described with an experimental evidence which combat with the control group. It's a randomization. It is accepted. He has proved that yoga will help to the children have the stress. Yesterday they were talking, it is not merely the children. Children is a taker. The giver is a teacher. The parents is a very important. The three people got, he has made it. What was the past in yoga, in the research? What is the present, what, going, what is going to be in the future? Really nicely presented. This is a general question any one of you can answer because both are uh, dealing with the study of yoga. On the, are there studies conducted of how yoga helps in development of creativity and intuition? And if yes, how do you really measure and quantify this? Because we know it does affect favorably, but how much and how, how, how would you quantify this study? We started our studies um, back in 2006. We started doing research with um, yoga in music students. And the idea was that with practice of yoga, they would be able to bring more creativity to their music performance. Now, the problem is that there are no good instruments to study creativity. There are no good questionnaires that, that, that allow us to study creativity. But we were able to look at a couple of other measures, and this is a paper that's going to be published soon. We looked at two outcome measures that are, rel that are related to creativity. One of these is mindfulness. And what we found is that the music students increased their mindfulness, whereas students that did not practice yoga did not have any changes in mindfulness. But the other thing that was a key was, the, was this construct of psychological construct called flow. Flow is the experience during an activity in which you have a sense of merger. You are involved in the practice. There's a sense of timelessness. There's a sense of joy. There's a sense of uh, unity within the experience of a practice. And we applied this flow questionnaire. And after six weeks of yoga, the music students that had practiced yoga had increases in flow experience, whereas the control subjects did not. So this is a hint that, indeed, we can improve um, this, these deep, deeper constructs of intuition and creativity, but it's difficult to study. There has been one study on transcendental meditation. They used what is called the Torrance Test of Creativity. It's a standardized test. As Satbir said, Dr. Kalsa said, it's very difficult to get a standardized test. In that test, they ask you, take a matchbox. Give me unusual uses of a matchbox. So you may say like you're using a matchbox to make a table. That's a creative way of using a matchbox. So we did do it for children, a single group study in the vacation in Bangalore. And I think it was published in IJPB way back in the 90s. It's a nice test, Torrance, T-O-R-R-A-N-C-E, test for creativity. You want an experimental instrument to measure it. You people are hearing, scientists are there, you try to get that instrument to measure. So this question is, uh, while presenting research on yoga, you use a single word, yoga. 
whereas yoga is a bundle of practices, many different types of yoga, many different styles. This is true. When, when we summarize the yoga research, we are being broadly inclusive. But we do have exclusion criteria. So generally, we do not include just a straight meditation practice, like just vipassana or transcendental meditation. We include practices that do have asana, pranayama, and meditation. So there is a general inclusion criteria. Now, of course, many different styles of yoga, there's Iyengar yoga, there's Patanjali yoga, there's Kaivalya Dhamma, there's the Svyasa, many different styles, many different focuses and emphasis. However, by and large, most of these achieve um, much the same type of outcome within, you know, 80, 90 percent. Uh, most of these are really achieving the same kind of thing. So there is justification for us using this broad term of yoga uh, to apply uh, to all of these kinds of studies. And, and the conclusions that come from these, I think, are, are generally safe. If we talk about yoga, we actually have to go back to the traditional texts. So if you go back to the Upanishads, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, you get a general idea about what yoga means. If you look at Hatha Yoga Pradipika, uh, or Hatha Yoga text, as you, uh, I know you all do refer to it like that uh, correctly here, Giranda Samhita, you actually get descriptions of the asanas, the pranayama, the mudras, the bandhas. So what has happened in the last 200 years is different schools have evolved based on these traditional texts, and they are called different names. Iyengar yoga, maybe um, Kaivalya Dham uh, has... No, 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 no. Uh, no Kaivalya Dham. So there is a, but there is a form of yoga here. It's not named that way. But, you know, people say, I go to Kaivalya Dham. That general idea. It's not given a name. So, like that, there are forms that have derived in the last 200 years. But all of them originate from the traditional texts. So, the very important thing is to read the traditional texts. You see, in any therapy, there are different prescriptions, like different asans or different... Uh, stages of pranayam. When a patient comes to you, to any therapist, he says, do this, this will help you. He can't say, do yoga. Similarly, when you make measurements of surveys, which particular part of asan or pranayam gives what result or effect, then one understands, yes, this is useful for this part. The different uh, level, different types of yoga are again bundle of different asanas. Or but this is a therapy of, like prescription, you have different medicines. You have to do applied research, therapeutic research in future. You can have, for example, when you take Kabbalabhati and Pranayama, which improves the vital capacity. Like that, they will be, no, they have started doing all this in therapeutic research. It's not initial stage. It is not there topmost what other researchers, oh, yoga research has started everything. So the days will come, everything, like right ear, left ear, specialization, the yoga, this yoga will be for psychosomatic disorder, this yoga for the diabetes, this yoga for the stress, this yoga for the depression, anxiety, emotional, it will come. It will take a lot of time. Can you introduce yourself? That yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm G. Ravindra. I was a former director of NCERT. Yeah. So, they emanated from yoga, concentration, imagination, and feeling. Now, uh, uh, the yoga meets heart, mind, and body. That's what is there. Even that soul also comes somewhere. But the point here is uh, there's so much of work is done. So much of work is done as far as the mind and body, but less is done for heart. And this is how I feel. Uh, because especially the feeling part of it. Because the way I'm telling is uh, a lot of mathematics is out of intuition. And intuition and feeling, they're face of the same coin. When you feel it, there's an intuition because uh, mathematics is not grown because of logic. Let us make it very, very clear. Logical thinking has not implied mathematics. It's the intuition. For example, take the, uh, they take the case of uh, Ramanujam or Gauss or whatever it is. They, they all, the strong intuition. I think the intuition part of it, somewhere we need to use yoga, 
how we can promote intuition because there is scope. I, I know I practiced a bit, but there is scope. I don't have any evidence to show in larger scale, but on my own, I did something. So please. There are two aspects to uh, feeling. One is intuition, as you have rightly said, and the other is compassion. We normally think that yoga goes with detachment. So one of our most recent publications has shown that it is possible to remain detached, but compassionate. And not only compassionate, but empathic, so that you sort of tune to the other person and have better intuition. So this has been just, this will be out in early 2016, um, showing that yes, yoga, the more detached and withdrawn you are from the world, the better you are tuned to other people's uh, feelings, things that are happening, and you are more sensitive and are able to sense it earlier on. So now we are having so many uh, research aspirants in India. More than 50 universities are giving guidance to research aspirants. So what is the future of uh, yoga research if th for Indians if they come to America? If they go, go. I don't have enough money for that. <laughs> Uh, the problem is the problem is in yoga research is is really getting the funding. Every week I get an email from someone who says, "Yoga changed my life. I'm a postdoctoral fellow. I'm a graduate student. I want to do yoga research. Can I come to your lab? Can I work with you? Can I? Can, how do I do yoga research?" And the problem is that there's just the funding is the problem. There's no limitation of being able to do yoga research as long as you have the funding. So that is, that is the limitation, not only for Indians coming to America, but even for Americans wanting to practice yoga research. Good. Are you satisfied? See, India has got a lot of fund. She has got uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, a lot of major research project. Why not you apply there? So this question is, what is your opinion about sport yoga? Well, um, this is really not on the topic of, of this symposium, but... Um, there are many different types of yoga practice, and yoga, as it's become popular, particularly in the West, has become diversified. That means there are very specific types of limited yoga practice. And many Indians are very upset about this. They say, you have taken our ancient sacred tradition and you are doing sport yoga and hot yoga and nude yoga and all of this. That's fine, I understand that sentiment. Um, but I think there is a positive side to this, that people that practice limited forms of yoga will get some kind of experience. And when they get that experience, they say, I want more, but I'm not getting it from this type of yoga practice. I will go to a traditional form of yoga practice and get it. So these limited forms of yoga, they're better than jogging, and they serve as a gateway to the more traditional practices of yoga. Myself, Brigadier Dharmadikari, I am asking a question related to the school bags becoming obese and so do the school children. With the increased obesity and with the burdened children with additional subject of yoga being taught in schools, how do we expect our children to cope up with all these realities of life, one? And the second thing is, how much of time is required to be devoted to yogic practices, so to say, as far as the schools are concerned, at various levels of schooling. I'll answer your uh, last question first. That is, we have done a pilot study with children uh, who had borderline obesity, and uh, we have found that 45 minutes of yoga practice a day where uh, half the time, that is 50% uh, of the time is spent in vigorous asanas, repetitive asanas, including Surya Namaskar as a separate practice, uh, Kapal Bhati as a breathing, high frequency yoga breathing, Bhastrika, and uh, these two breathing practices, uh, as well as a very short guided relaxation, were able to reduce the uh, uh, body mass index of these children who were obese over a 15 day period, 45 minutes every day for six days in a week for 15 days. So that seems encouraging, but it has to be a long term follow up. So there are two factors in obesity. One is physical activity, and the other one is eating behavior. And many people have, some, some people have said, oh, yoga is not good for reducing weight because it has, it's not aerobic. You can't burn calories with yoga because it's a low-level activity. They are mistaking 
the most important aspects of obesity and its risk factors, which is general overall physical activity and eating behavior. And two factors play into that. And there are two factors that yoga addresses very well. One is stress, and the other one is mind-body awareness. If you reduce stress, you reduce stress-induced eating behavior. If you increase mind-body awareness, you have children gravitating to physical activity because they are improving their awareness of how it feels to have physical activity. They feel good, they feel it, they do more physical activity. Same with eating. They become aware of when they are full. They become aware, they become aware of what, how it feels to eat certain kinds of foods. And so they will gravitate towards healthier foods and lower portions. So with yoga, you are addressing the two most key factors with obesity, which is stress and self-awareness. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, from Mr. Kalsa, what type of uh, practices, yogic practices he has given, whether it is the dynamic or static, uh, whether he has modified the uh, uh, module for the, to, to, to make the practices very much suitable for the children. You so we have yoga instructors who are highly qualified, who develop a manualized curriculum, a formal cu curriculum. This curriculum is developed so that it, it is appropriate to the children, so that it engages them, it encourages them to practice. What you teach to adults, you can't teach to children. You yeah, that, have is, to that, 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 that is a modification we do normally. What type of modification, even if you are not, if you are not, directly, if you are not directly involved, what type of modification they had done? I can't, school I can't give you the details, but obviously you, you have to reduce the duration of the exercises. You have to, depending upon the grade, is very different. You know, you know a, a second standard child from a 12th standard child is a very different uh, intervention that you're going to give. To a 12th standard child, you can give them uh, full asanas and, and, pr and pranayama practice. To a young child who's in kindergarten or first standard, you have to make this as games, uh, as simple practices. So you have to adjust very much to the population that you are doing. And this is what this book that was created, this white book, Best Practices, is talking about. It's talking about adjusting the yoga to be suitable to the population. There's no point in giving yoga to children that they will not practice. I'm Kuperkar. What I, I'm referring to the uh, data of Dr. Shirley Tellis. In the Indian conditions, to improve the, uh, uh, improve the facilities to poor people, poor uh, students, that is the most important thing. And they are not uh, at, you know, coming to schools and uh, they are not capable of attending the school or joining the school because of high uh, fees. So how are we are going to give the uh, benefit of yoga to those people? Not even students, but even poor uh, community also, that, that is a problem. We are seeing all our white-collared people. So how are we to go about it? Yeah, This is a very important point. There are two answers to it. One is, it has to be made at a policy level. This is a policy that the poor have to be taken care of in any country. But I can answer that every yoga institution can do their bit. And along with giving yoga to the schools, they can give a free meal, they can give a free yoga mat, they can give yoga clothes. This is what we did when we introduced yoga in the school. We gave some incentive to the children because you cannot teach yoga to empty stomachs. My name is Arun Sarma, retired scientific officer BRC, a student of Yoga Vidya Niketan Vasi, Mumbai. As I saw this sketch, Charles Darwin theory that we are the descendant of ape, gorilla, monkey. They all are jumping. They are doing exercise. Exercise in our DNA, not yoga particularly adolescents and children, how this transformation can be takes place from exercise to yoga, what technique you are evolving, and what theory you are looking for. We're, we are not changing the DNA. You cannot change the DNA. You can only change which genes are active and how much they are active. And so yoga differs from exercise in a very specific way. It involves control of attention. That is what the, the, one of the key differences between yoga and typical exercise is the control of attention. Um, so that is one of the key differences. The other thing is that typical modern Western exercise does not involve a lot of stretching. 
and, and isometric postures. And that is one of the strengths of yoga type practices. So the type of yoga that's practiced in asana is different from Western exercise. And this control of attention is one of the key factors reducing stress. I want to draw your attention. We all are talking what yoga can do. We are not talking. I remember incidents when some person came to Swami Kovalananda and said, Swamiji, you have written that if you do half an hour Sishasan, your hair will be black. I am doing one hour, but my all the hairs have become white. <laughs> His answer was, you are concentrating only what I have said, but also I meant that what you are doing in 23 hours also is very important. <laughs> so, don't think that if you do something that will change your whole pattern of life. You have to see what you are doing otherwise also is very, very important. One thing, as regards the question of exercise is concerned, we have to refer to Patanjali. When he describes asanas, he says, Thir Sukham Asana. Asana is that which gives you at the physical level, the steadiness, and at the psychological level, feeling of well-being. Then the next sutra, he says, how it is to be done? Prayatna shaitilya anant samapatya bhyam. There has to be in exercise, it is dynamic. Effortless is not there. But in asanas, the main point is effortlessness. You should, as if the asanas are happening, you are not doing. And that brings the change in that basic level. Pratna Shaitil Anant Samapate Bhyam. Then he is, this is effort, physical effort. But what about mental condition? So the concentration. Anant Samapate Bhyam. Try to in, concentrate on infinity or any part of your body where your mind does not work, does not disturb. Because you should remember the main difference of Indian psychology and Western psychology is Western psychology thinks of abnormality in the mind. We think mind itself is abnormal. We have to go beyond the mind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody wanted to ask the question? No question. You are fully understood or you have not understood. The both the things question will <laughs> come. Um, my name is Ila. I am from New York. My question is to Dr. Khalsa. Um, I am a product of the university system in the United States, and an imminent and persistent problem that I've seen amongst my peers is that there is a wide misuse of prescription drugs, such as Ritalin and Adderall, Adderall for the purpose of concentration, during exams, during finals, for writing papers, because these drugs are used as mechanisms to increase concentration, and they're widely misused. So I'm wondering if there has been any sort of research effort to see the effects of yoga to counteract the, use, the misuse of these prescription drugs. Well, there's no question that um, modern medicine is quite happy taking drugs for everything. Um, and the problem is that a lot of these times, a lot of the times in a lot of instances, um, there are behavioral strategies that work better than, than drugs do. There is evidence, and, and Dr. Tellis has published some of the evidence showing that cognitive performance and attention can be improved with yoga practices. And there are a number of studies on meditation practices, including mindfulness meditation, which have shown improvement in attention tasks and attention tests. Um, so there's two aspects to this. One is that if you reduce um, the impediments to cognitive performance, like depression, anxiety, and stress, you allow more resources in the central nervous system to be able to focus on the tasks at hand. The other aspect is a direct effect on attention and cognitive function, and that is when you exercise the mind in control of concentration and in control of attention, you are exercising the attention networks in the brain. That means you improve the ability of your attention networks to function, and you make structural changes in the brain that maintain that improvement in academic and cognitive performance. So, there is basic research that, that, that gives us the sense that this is quite possible to improve this. But the problem really is, is the mental mindset of, of modern medicine, that drugs are okay to take, 
All of these drugs have major impacts on central nervous system neurotransmitter activity. We have no idea of the long-term uh, uh, negative effects of this on functioning. Um, and this is one of the movements in integrative medicine to get away from this whole idea that drugs are the solution to everything. Thank you so much for all these uh, orators, both the medical practitioners, wonderfully they described your patient listening, nice questions. Everybody is really knowledgeable and your brilliant things. Why, greet it goes to Kaivale Dhamma.